Um, so, reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita, as it is, chapter 1, text 16 to 18. This is on page number 42 of the small book. Um, so, I think we will just chant the first, there are three verses here, so we'll just chant the first one, repeat the first one, and then I'll chant the, the other two by myself. King Yudhishthira, the son of Kunti, blew his conch shell, the Ananta Vijaya, and Nakula and, Sahade, Nakula and Sahadeva blew the Shugosha and Mani Pushpaka. That great archer, the king of Kashi, the great fighter Shikandi, Drishtadyumna, Virata, the unconquerable Satyaki, Drupada, the sons of Draupadi, and others, O king, such as the mighty armed son of Subhadra, all blew their respective conch shells. Purport. Sanjaya informed King Dhritarashtra very tactfully that his unwise policy of deceiving the sons of Pandu and, en and endeavouring to enthrone his own sons on the seat of the kingdom was not very laudable. The signs already clearly indicated that the whole Kuru dynasty would be killed in that great battle. Beginning with the great grandsire Bhishma, down to the grandsons like Abhimanyu and others, including kings from many states of the world, all were present there, and all were doomed. The whole catastrophe was due to King Dhritarashtra because he encouraged the policy followed by his sons. Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadama Hyam Dadati Sopadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagajatam Sagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajeevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindho Dheena Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Haripriye Vansha Kalpataru Bhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namonamaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare King Yudhishthira, the son of Kunti, blew his conch shell, the Ananta Vijaya, and Nakula and Zahadeva blew the Shugosha and Mani Pushpaka. That great archer, the king of Kashi, the great fighter Shikandi, Dushtadyumna, Virata, the unconquerable Satyaki, Drupada, the sons of Draupadi, and others, O king, such as the mighty armed son of Subhadra, all blew their, respectful, their respective conch shells. So, um... First, before I begin, I'd like to um, thank all the devotees here uh, for the Second Avenue Bhagavad Gita program, um, especially Atmanivedan Prabhu, Kali Krishna Prabhu, um, for kindly um, giving me an opportunity to speak here. I personally consider this as a blessing of Srila Prabhupada because whatever happens in Second Avenue um, is the transcendental arrangement of the Supreme Lord, this being a very holy place. Of pilgrimage for uh, the members of the Krishna consciousness movement and so I pray that um, Srila Prabhupada will be pleased by my attempt to uh, repeat his his words so um, <clears throat> so what we're seeing over here in chapter 1 of the Bhagavad Gita is as Srila Prabhupada um, describes um, he calls it observing the armies. He called the first chapter observing the armies. So the, the Bhagavad Gita is a very ancient text, a very famous text. And in Sanskrit it is called Yoga Shastra. Yoga Shastra means a text of yoga or a scripture of yoga. Srila Prabhupada explains that yoga, what a Yoga Shastra means is that the Bhagavad Gita is basically one chapter after the other. It just describes different forms of yoga, ultimately culminating in uh, the devotional service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, um, also known as Bhakti Yoga. And um, 
the first chapter in Sanskrit is called Arjuna Vishala Yoga. So why is the Bhagavad Gita called a Yoga Shastra? The Bhagavad Gita is called Yoga Shastra because Yoga is meant to link. As Srila Prabhupada explains, Yoga is linking process, linking process with the Supreme. And the Bhagavad Gita explains different methods by which one can link with the Supreme. So, how is a description of different warriors on a historical battlefield um, have anything to do with us linking with the Supreme? It does because the context of the Bhagavad Gita, sorry, the context of the Bhagavad Gita is not a situation where you have um, two sages with long beards and matted hair who act in a manner that is very different to normal people in the world. They've given up everything. They're sitting in the, a cave in the Himalayas or in Tibet or somewhere and they are discussing some philosophical thing. No. The Bhagavad Gita presents a situation that is present in all of our lives. What is that? It's a regular man with a family and with problems in life to deal with. And it's not just problems from his boss. Um, it's problems from his enemies. It's problems from his own family. So this is what is the scene over here is this battle of Kurukshetra is being fought by the Pandavas for their survival. Arjuna is one of the Pandavas. He and his four other brothers um, have been um, wrongly treated by their cousins and their kingdom usurped. So they don't have any place to go. They don't have anywhere to live. And as kings, as administrators, they need the, their method of survival is administration. For instance, um, you know there are there are people who are natural businessmen, the natural entrepreneurs, and they just can't work under somebody else. Even if you put them on the moon, they'll try to start a business there. That's their nature. And that's how they, that's how they survive. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, Krishna explains later in the Bhagavad Gita that different people have different natures. The beauty of Bhakti Yoga is that all these natures can be dovetailed in Krishna consciousness. Whereas in the other processes of Yoga, as it will be described in the Bhagavad Gita, these natures have to be given up. Or, or in the case of like karma yoga, these natures have to lead to a higher process of yoga. So for instance, Krishna explains the process of dhyana yoga and there he says, okay, so you have, to, you have to go and find a peaceful place in the forest, subsist on just roots and fruits and you have to form a seat, an elevated seat, cover it with deer skin, sit with the back straight, with the eyes focused on the tip of the nose and the mind focused on the form of the Supreme Personality called Paramatma in the heart. Um, some people can do this, but most can't. And especially in this age of Kali Yuga, it's not very practical. And that Arjuna himself says. So Arjuna is a, is a family man. He has sons. He has, um, he has, he has wives. And... Um, He's trying to survive in the world. And that's similar to what we're going through. We are also trying to survive. Our, our, our lives are a um, struggle for existence. At, at, um, and uh, that we can see, especially in a city like New York. It's, um, it is a struggle for existence. And what is complicated in the struggle for existence is that we sometimes have to um, have to face difficulties from people we love. We sometimes have to face betrayals. We sometimes have to face 
um, outright um, discrimination from family members or people we depend on, like government officials, or you know, and and our own, um, you know, co-workers or employees at work or or in school, um, your fellow students, and this is not a very pleasant situation. And this is what is being described over here, that the scene is being set to describe Arjuna's lamentation. That's what is called as this chapter is called Arjuna Vishala Yoga. Arjuna's lamentation. Arjuna is lamenting. Why is my situation like this? Why does life have to be like this? And that is, that, that is what the entire first chapter is about. Is first the scene is being set. Now, interestingly, um, from text 14, there are descriptions of signs of victory for Arjuna. Arjuna is fighting this battle which has been, which his cousin um, Duryodhana has um, waged on them, has forced them to participate in this battle, quite unfairly, against their own will. Now, in spite of that, um, there are signs of victory for, for, uh, for, for Arjuna and his brothers. And so, from text 14, these, these signs of victory are described. For instance, in text 14, um, Arjuna is described to have a great chariot. And Srila Prabhupada writes in the purport that this chariot was donated by the god of fire, Agni, and can, is capable of conquering all directions. And um, apart from that, Arjuna and Krishna's conch shells are said to be divyam, transcendental. And so in this way, um, one will see that these, the signs of victory are being described over here. Now, Sanjaya, who is relating this incident to Dhritarashtra, Dhritarashtra is the father of um, Duryodhana, the evil cousin of Arjuna. And um, this blind king, he was actually blind, Dhritarashtra, encouraged his sons to wage this battle, which was completely unnecessary because the Pandavas, for instance, they didn't even ask for the whole kingdom. They just asked five villages. Just give us five villages, a village each for each brother to just rule. That's it. This is what we know to do. This is how we, this is how we've grown up. So let live and let live. But Unfortunately, that's not the situation in this world. And so this is the scene over here. And um, Sanjaya is informed, uh, sorry, Sanjaya informed King Dhritarashtra very tactfully that his unwise policy of deceiving the sons of Pandu and endeavoring to enthrone his own sons on the seat of the kingdom was not very laudable. Now, there's a, it is not laudable because it's basically trying to oppress someone from, from, from just living a normal life. And therefore, it's an act of evil. And there's nothing laudable in that. There's nothing laudable in, 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 in stealing another person's apartment. And sometimes we see this, unfortunately, like in New York. Sometimes, you know, there are, there are people who are very expert in the nuances of tenant law. And what they do is they enter your apartment somehow with some kind of a lease and uh, they just stay. And uh, you try to evict them, it's, it's almost, it's, it's such an uphill battle. And in many cases, it's like there's no hope. But what fault did you do? Nothing. He just eyed your house and he thought, hey, this is for me. And that's the same thing Duryodhana is doing. Therefore, although this looks like a historical incident from some remote part in India 5,000 years ago, it has relevance to New York City today. And therefore, the Bhagavad Gita is a transcendental literature. Transcendental literature where every single page is relevant to our lives. There are so many instructions that we can gain from every single page of the Bhagavad Gita.
And so what Duryodhana did is, is not laudable. It's, it's very shameful that you are a king. You're expected. For instance, if the president engages in corruption, that's more abominable than the local storekeeper engaging in corruption. Why? It's corruption anyways. But because you have a position of responsibility, you have a position of authority, and you're expected to behave better. But, unfortunately, morality in this age, especially in this age that we live in, is, 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 is not valued so much. Although, by all logical means, morality will allow everyone to live happily. Such morality is not, is not considered important. In fact, such morality is not even taught of, um, um, is, not, is, not, is not even taught in schools or educational institutions. Because what is morality? This is, the, this is based on the understanding of the soul. Without the understanding of the soul, there cannot be an understanding of morality because according to the person who stole someone's apartment, some landlord's apartment, he thinks that's right. He thinks that's the way he has to live. And uh, there are other people who go and shoot and kill other, like, you know, they just go into a, into a concert or, or a school and they kill people. Or... I kill someone in the name of religion, in the name of God, and I think it's right. Whereas you think it's wrong. So what is right and what is wrong? Arjuna is confused about this. Therefore, Arjuna Vishala Yoga, he's confused. Duryodhana thinks he's right. He thinks, I have a right to this kingdom. So why are these Pandavas? I don't care about them. I have a, I have a right to live. I don't care about the Pandavas. I don't care how they live. That's none of my business. Let them go to hell. I need to take care of myself. And uh, Arjuna is lamenting this, this situation. And um, so, and, and what's unfortunate is Dhritarashtra, his father, is a very old man. And as an old man, he's expected to be wise. But unfortunately, he acts in a most unwise manner by encouraging his sons to pursue this path of degradation, this path of, of infamy. And not only that, the signs already clearly indicated that the whole Kuru dynasty would be killed in that great battle, beginning with the great grandsire Bhishma, down to the grandsons like Abhimanyu and others, including kings from many states of the world, all were present there and all were doomed. The whole catastrophe was due to King Dhritarashtra because he encouraged the policy followed by his sons. Basically, greed leads to destruction. Destruction of the person who is greedy and destruction of those who have been uh, unfortunately treated, mistreated and treated badly. So that is another moral that we um, receive from, from the Bhagavad Gita. Um, I would like to uh, um, read one more verse and then maybe some other verses, but and I will continue on talking on this subject. So text 19. So Gosho Dhartarashtra Nam Hudayani Vedyarayat Nabascha Pitivim Chaiva Tumulo Bhyanunadhayan. The blowing of these different conch shells became uproarious, vibrating both in the sky and on earth. It shattered the hearts of the sons of Dhritarashtra. Purport, when Bhishma and the others on the side of Duryodhana blew their respective conch shells, there was no heartbreaking on the part of the Pandavas. Such occurrences are not mentioned. But in this particular verse, it is mentioned that the hearts of the sons of Dhritarashtra were shattered by the sounds vibrated by the Pandavas' party. This is due to the Pandavas and their confidence in Lord Krishna. One who takes shelter of the Supreme Lord has nothing to fear, even in the midst of the greatest calamity. So, the Pandavas, in, in many ways, Duryodhana, the opposing party, um, arranged the battle in such a way that from all logical um, you know, um, from, from all points of logical reasoning, the Pandavas and Arjuna should have lost. Why? 
Duryodhana had better warriors on his side. He had more people on, he had more warriors. Not only did he have better warriors, he had more warriors on his side. And these warriors, several of them were never defeated in battle, such as Bhishma and uh, Drona, etc. Whereas um, on the side of the Pandavas, you have practically kids like Abhimanyu, who was just 16 years old when he was fighting the battle of, of, of Kurukshetra. So what chance did they have? Not much of a chance. But in spite of that, it is stated here that when, when the sight of the Pandavas blew their conch shells, it shattered the hearts of, 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 of the Kauravas, headed by Duryodhana. Why? Because they were supported by Krishna. So this is where the, the aspect of being supported by Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although the Pandavas, by material calculation, could not win, because Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was on their side, they were assured all signs of victory. And these are the omens that are being described over here. That the, the side of the, the Kauravas, their hearts sank when the, when the conch shells were blown. So, how to understand this? That when, when Prabhupada states here, the most important point in this purport over here is, one who takes shelter of the Supreme Lord has nothing to fear, even in the midst of the greatest calamity. The point is, from the Bhagavad Gita, we understand who is in control. We understand that this world is actually controlled by a Supreme Lord, by the Supreme Personality of God. Krishna says, Aham sarvasya prabhavo mata sarvam pravartate. He states this in the Bhagavad Gita, that I am the source of all existence, and that from me, everything emanates. That means there is a controller. The point is, in this material world, there is an illusion that there are different controllers. There is an illusion that the president of America controls America. There is an illusion that um, I control my life. There's 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 actually an illusion that even the there's an illusion that um, the, the 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 person who drives the airplane is in control of the airplane, but actually we're not in control. We do not have control over this material world. Therefore, now a very good incident to understand this is the current um, um, pandemic, or well, it's not been termed as a pandemic yet. It's, 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 being spread, it's spreading all over the world. People don't even understand. Now, all sorts of measures were taken. Of course, the politicians are arguing. Um, they're the Republicans didn't do their job, the Democrats criticizing, this is all one thing. But, they are trying to control the situation and here you've got people who've been infected and they don't even understand how they got infected. Who's in control? What's going on? Where did this virus come from? Where is it going on? How do we understand? The thing is, we're not in control. The material nature under the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, Devi Esha Gunamai Mama Maya Duratyaya Mame Vaye Prapadyante Maya Metam Tarantite that this material world is actually illusion. This material world, the nature of the material energy is called Maya, it's called illusion. Why? Because it's not what it seems. It's like when you're driving on the highway. It looks like you see a puddle of water in front of you when it's hot. But actually there's no puddle of water. That's just an illusion. And when you go closer, there's no water. And it's stated, um, we fortunately do not have an experience. But there are people who, in the midst of the Sahara Desert in Africa, were stranded. They're trying to find water. And they look... It looks like there's some water over there. They go in that direction, there's no water. And then turn around, they go in another direction. It looks like there's water, there's no water. And this is basically the pursuit of happiness in the material world. Is that we are trying to control this material world in our own capacities. In our own small ways. Whatever, in whatever way I can. I, I control my apartment 
and um, the CEO of a multinational comp corporation controls that corporation and uh, world leaders why for control over the world and actually that's what's the Mahabharata war is this 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 Kurukshetra war is several leaders trying to control um, dominion over the world trying to uh, establish dominion over the world but actually there's only one person who's in control and that's the supreme personality of God now the human form of life is meant to understand this the human form of life is meant to understand that I'm trying to control my life I'm trying to control situations because if everything was in our control why are we not happy why is happiness just out of the reach of our hand because it because we're not in control otherwise you know given the choice we would we would we would we always endeavor not given the choice every single endeavor that we make is for for happiness even the way you you sit you just choose a particular cushion when you come inside even that even a simple activity like that is meant to give you happiness what to speak of working a job what to speak of getting education what to speak of, of finding a partner in life or having kids what to speak of all this even a small activity like choosing between orange juice and apple juice is just another pursuit of happiness is another attempt in satisfying our need for happiness but that happiness cannot be found in matter because we are spirit soul the, the the this is the basic teaching in bhagavad gita see what happens is arjuna is confronting his his teachers his grandfathers his uncles his 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 brothers his sons he's fighting against them in a battle and he comes to arjuna he says look the best thing to do is for me to just go to the forest and live a life on fruits and roots because i don't want to fight this battle i don't want to kill and I don't want to be killed either. So what to do? Because in this battle, the other party is intent on killing me. And the only way I can protect myself is by killing them. I don't want this. I just want to go to the forest. And, and then he gives, he gives so many good arguments in the forthcoming verses. Why to not fight the battle? And his arguments are really good. He gives very good arguments. But he misses one point he misses the understanding that the spirit soul is ultimately part and parcel of Krishna. And this is the basic teaching that, that Krishna starts from. He starts this in the middle of a battlefield. Here's a guy who is who's completely confused about his duty. Like, and therefore, although all of us have different problems in life, we all have different issues. We have maybe some disease that we're trying to fight. Or maybe we're trying to, you know, um, stabilize our income. Or whatever the problem might be. But the solution for all those problems, as Krishna did in Bhagavad Gita, is to learn about the nature of the soul. Is to learn about us. Is to learn about who we are. Just like... You have a phone. Now, unless you identify this as a phone, you will not use it as a phone. For me, this is just some... If, 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 if I am uneducated about the nature of the phone, it's just some heavy object. And say I hate someone in this room, I can just fling it, fling it on them and, and injure them. Cause injury. It'll do the job, but not so effective. You know, so there, what's the problem here? It'll injure the person, but it's, he's probably going to fling something, um, you know, much better at you because you flung something pretty stupid at him, even if you wanted to harm him, you know. So understanding the nature of an object is very important to understand the proper utilization of the object. I can, I can, if... If I don't understand this as a phone, I can use it for something else, but it is going to cause me a lot more dissatisfaction. Just like if I probably hurled a stone at someone, maybe that would have done a better job of what I intended. 
right? Then, then a phone. So similarly, we've got this human form of life, we've got this body, this body is an object. If we don't understand this body, the nature of this body, if we don't understand who we are, the soul, then our endeavors to achieve happiness and satisfaction will always be baffled. Therefore, Krishna first starts instructing about the soul. This is the first instruction he gives. And um, so, he, Krishna explains that the spirit soul, the first thing he explains about the spirit soul is he characterizes the spirit soul as different from matter. Why? Why is it important to know that the spirit soul is different from matter? Because by that understanding, we will understand that actually we cannot achieve happiness through matter. Any amount of, no amount of matter will give us the happiness that the soul is seeking. The soul needs spiritual happiness. The soul, the soul can find happiness only in spirit. So that is the first understanding that, that, that Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita. And that is the first understanding he presents to Arjuna. And uh, this is an important understanding for us. Yes, does that mean we stop eating, we stop sleeping, and maybe, you know, just forget life altogether? No. We have to take care of the body. And bodily, ne bodily needs have to be taken care. But that has to be done with the understanding of the soul. It's just like we, we, we've all seen a car. Many of us have probably used a car. Now, a car is a great um, tool to get from one place to another. However, if you don't understand that more important than the car is the person in the car, that's us. Then, if we misidentify ourselves with the car, then we tend to suffer more. For instance, when we're really attached to the car, a car, if someone scratches the car, you feel like if someone scratched your face. It, he didn't scratch your face. It had nothing to do with you. You are separate from the car. But that is, the, that, is the, that, is, that is what is called attachment. For instance, if I love someone, and I see a third person punch my loved one on my, in their face, and I feel like he punched my face. And immediately I, want, I wish to go and retaliate. So, this is, the, this is the nature of attachment. This is also explained in Bhagavad Gita. The nature of attachment causes a sense of belongingness. And right now, the spirit soul is very attached, or us, the spirit soul, very attached to the body. We are so attached to the body that we think we are the body. And we are not the body. We think we are Indian, um, Russian, or American, or something like this. And then when I, when I put myself in such a kind of a conception, then maybe the Russians are my enemies. And... Uh, uh, the, 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 some, some, some class of people that come from South America are low class people that I don't want in my country. Or all sorts of things. Lots of discrimination. This is the source of discrimination. is misidentification with the body. We have nothing to do with the body. The soul in itself is a spirit. Is, 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 is a spiritual particle that is not different from you, me, the dog being walked on the street. Or the rat that's running um, in the sewer under this building. It's the same. There's, there's no difference. Therefore, when you're on the platform of the soul, there is a samadharshina, Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, Pandita samadharshina, that he views all living entities in the same way. He views them with the same eyes. But what does it mean, same? It doesn't mean same on the bodily platform. It's not that a, 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 a spiritually enlightened person, a sadhu, a Krishna conscious person, he, he views, now he views a tiger and, and, and another human being as the same in the sense that he sees the spirit, spiritual spark inside both of them as, as being the same. But still, 
because the tiger is not a self-realized soul, you have to keep a little distance away from the tiger. You don't have to do that. Perhaps you don't have to do that in the same way with a human being. So, spiritual knowledge is not impractical. Spiritual knowledge is not artificial equality. Spiritual knowledge is real equality. Because otherwise, why is Krishna explaining, for instance, there are different natures. People have different natures. If, if you don't identify that there are different natures and there are different talents, and you try to artificially put everyone on the same platform, then they're going to be dissatisfied. Because there is the body. The body is there. It's not that the body is not there. But the body should not be given more importance than the soul. This is the point. And the problem that Arjuna was facing was that he was giving more importance to the body than he was giving to the soul. And therefore, he was confused about his duty. And uh, that is our situation also, is that we tend to give more importance to the body, but that's not who we are. It's like giving more importance to the car. Okay, but you need to feed yourself too. You put gas in the car, you fill oil, you know, do all that maintenance work. But if you don't feed yourself, you're not going to be happy. So the spirit soul has a need. And that need is achieved through yoga. But what is that yoga? That yoga is the process of linking with the Supreme. And why does the, why does the spirit soul have to link with the Supreme in the first place? Because the spirit soul is part and parcel of Krishna. Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, Mamai Vamsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana Manashastani Indriyani Prakritistani Karshati That the living entities in the material world are part and parcels of me, Krishna says. Krishna says of, of himself. And, but then what are they doing? Manashastani um, Indriyani They are utilizing the mind and the senses, indriyani, prakritistani karsati, and are trying to control this material nature in various ways. They're trying to control this material nature in different ways. And karsati, and because of that they are struggling. Why are they struggling? Why do we struggle trying to control material nature? Because of two reasons. First, we are not the creators of material nature. We appear in material nature. We are within material nature. We did not create this world. We did not create anything that came. We did not create anything that we see in this world. We came in this world empty-handed and that's how we will leave. That's how we will leave at the time of death. But in between we're trying to, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, this is, this belongs to me and things like that. So Karshati, struggling. The second reason is what I just stated is because intrinsically, oil and water just don't mix. And so the spirit soul and the body, although they are together, just like oil and water seem as if they are together, they actually never mix. So the spirit soul remains uncontaminated by material nature, but when it, when it identifies itself with material nature, it suffers because it is trying to seek happiness in matter. Why is that? Because the spirit soul... The first characteristic of the spirit soul is that it is eternal. But everything in the material world is temporary. You buy a car, you, it's your favorite car. You finally got it. Unfortunately, it's not going to last. And then we get frustrated. Um, as, a, as, as, as a child growing up, you know, I used to look up, or everyone, we all look up to youth, to being young, full of uh, vitality and vigor. But unfortunately, as many, po many poets in the history of, of, of human civilization have described how, this, how youth is so fleeting. How youth is, it just, just, just goes away. And then, and then so it's like, it's, they say, I mean, many poets have described like this, is that first you're, you're aspiring to achieve youth, and then it, everything just gets over so quickly, and then you're just lamenting its loss. And so, in this way, the spirit soul is frustrated because it is seeking eternality in a realm of temporality. In a world, in a world that is temporary. 
Srila Prabhupada writes very nicely in, um, in the introduction to Bhagavad Gita that the conditioned soul is always threatened with non-existence. Because in this material world, there is always the threat of non-existence. Empires come and empires go. New York City came. Sorry to break the bad news. New York City is going to go someday. It's not going to last. I hate to say it. That's the truth. You know, there are many, many great empires in history. People thought the Roman Empire would never end. It ended. There are many, many other, there are many other empires that, that rule the planet. Um, uh, for instance, the British Empire, they said the sun never sets in the British Empire. Because they had conquered, you know, some place or the other across the globe. So the sun never set on the British Empire. So it was very amazing. But what's Britain now? Very, very, very small compared to its, its former um, expanse. That is the nature of the material world. And the spirit soul is frustrated, is sad at, at this scenario. But the hope is we are, we are not threatened by non-existence. We are eternal. That is the knowledge that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita. The first knowledge he gives to Arjuna. He's like, first, why are you concerned that they're going to die or you're going to die? Both of you are not going to die. Both of you are eternal. Your spirit soul. You're not going to die. No one is going to die. The body is going to die. But you as an individual are not, you do not perish. And um, Socrates was famous for this. He, he was one of the western philosophers who had a realization that he is not the body. But that he is the dweller within the body. And therefore when, when, the, um, when, uh, when the rulers... They didn't, uh, when they were upset with, uh, with, with Socrates and threatened him, threatened to kill him if he did not withdraw his, 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 his philosophy or if he didn't withdraw his statements, um, Socrates just took a cup of poison, drank it and said, catch me if you can. And he fell dead. But he was, he, he had a realization that I'm not this body. You can take, you can take the body that you call Socrates, but Socrates is not here. So this is that liberating experience that when one understands that one is spirit soul, one is eternal. But then that alone is not enough to satisfy the soul. The soul seeks satisfaction in linking with the Supreme because we are part of the Supreme. Just like the hand is, is part of the body. So the hand's duty is to serve the body. When it serves the body, the hand, the, the, the hand is nourished. The hand achieves happiness and the body achieves happiness. And therefore, there is an intimate relationship between the hand and the body. In a similar way, the spirit soul is so intimately connected with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, with the Source, with Krishna, that it's, it, we are qualitatively one with Him, although we are quantity. In quantity, we are different, just like the body is, is much larger compared to the, to the, to the hand itself. But, when the spirit soul serves the Supreme Personality of God, when the spirit soul connects with Krishna in the process of yoga, he becomes very, very satisfied. He becomes very happy. And so this is the teaching of Bhagavad Gita. And in Bhagavad Gita, and, and, and when one links with the Supreme Personality of Godhead as Arjuna and his, and his four other brothers, um, did so. They took shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They were protected from all calamity. So similarly, when we take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead through the process of, of Bhakti Yoga, there are many, many types of yoga that are explained. But only in Bhakti Yoga can one take to Krishna consciousness, can one link with the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the most effective and easy manner. In one's own position. Okay, so you are Say you're a student, or you're a professor, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're a lawyer, you whatever you may be. Still you can link with the Supreme Personality of God. And in the other processes of yoga, it's not like that. You have to develop certain qualifications. You have to develop certain qualifications to achieve um, 
yoga. Same thing with Ashtanga yoga. You can do pranayama, you can do yoga asanas. Now these things can be done for health, but for self-realization, one has to take the process of Krishna consciousness because in the other processes, there are many rules and regulations that you have to follow. In Bhakti Yoga, the only rules and regulation is to always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. It's a very simple process. And that begins with chanting the holy names of the Lord. That begins with chanting this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Because Krishna and His name are not different. By chanting His holy names, we connect with Him. How? How do we connect with Him? How do you connect with anyone in this world? By associating with them. You know, now, if, if I want to develop friendship with someone, I start associating with them. So the process of Bhakti Yoga is very natural in that sense. It is very natural because it is what we are doing. But it, in, 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 this, in, in, in our conditioned life, we are also seeking relationships. We have relationships with people. And we know how to cultivate those relationships. If I, if I love someone, then I start acting in a manner that pleases them. And there is reciprocal relationship also. They also start acting in a manner that, that, that pleases myself. So in this way, the, 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 condition, this, the soul aspiring to become a devotee of Krishna starts to develop this relationship with Krishna. And therefore, whatever rules and regulations that you find in Krishna consciousness are all basic, basically just centered around the principle of cultivating love. But love cannot be cultivated artificially. Love is not selfish. Real love is not selfish. Real love is all about the other person. But it fully satisfies oneself. Although that love in the material world is glorified in, 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 in so many songs, in so many movies and all this, because it's based on the body, it doesn't last. At the maximum, it will last till the time of death. After that, the Bhagavatam explains that in the material world is such that they are, it is like straws in, 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 in a flowing river. By the force of time, a few straws might bunch up together by the force of the river stream, by the force of the current. They might come together and then they will flow together for some time. And then how do they split? By the very same force of the river, by the very same river current, they are split apart. So, the Srimad Bhagavatam explains by the force of time, by the force of karma. These are all explained in Bhagavad Gita. What is karma? Um, by, 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 the, by the agency of karma, which is another energy and aspect of the Supreme Personality of God at Krishna, we come together. We come together as father, son, mother, sister, brother, wife, children, boss, um, you know, servant, and like this. And by that very same force of time, we're split apart. Although we might desire to do something else, we are separated. Um, so, but however, when one develops relationship with Krishna, because that is on the platform of the soul, it is eternal because that is the actual relationship with, with of the uh, that is the actual position of the spirit soul. So in this way, um, Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita. He starts with the knowledge of the soul, and then he progressively explains about the science of bhakti yoga. And to very simply explain the science of bhakti yoga is very simple. You chant the holy names of Krishna by chanting the holy names of Krishna, by constantly chanting the holy names of Krishna, we develop a relationship with Krishna. And as we develop a relationship with Krishna, then we start acting in a manner that is pleasing to Krishna. How do we know how to act in a manner that is pleasing to Krishna? We take the instructions of the spiritual master. We take instructions of Srila Prabhupada. Why? Because self-realized souls who already have a relationship with a person will tell you. Just like, you know, if, you, if, if a man starts to fall in love with a girl, he goes and asks the, 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 the girl's friends, hey, what is she like? Does she, you know, what, what, what's, what's her favorite color? And then he surprises her. 
So in this way, the spiritual master is a bona fide representative of Krishna. He instructs us in this process and those instructions are given in, the, in, in these wonderful books um, that Srila Prabhupada has written. And by reading these books, by associating with devotees, that's another thing, you associate with devotees. Why? Because of the same reason. In the association of devotees, Krishna is present. And through this association, we achieve the greatest fulfillment. And, and what's there? Does it cost uh, $20,000? No, it doesn't cost anything. You don't lose anything. Give it a try. Give it a shot. Associate with the devotees and you will find happiness. Follow the instructions that Srila Prabhupada stated in his books and chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Take prasadam. It's a wonderful process. You don't have to give up anything. You just have to dovetail. Whatever you're doing in life just has to be diverted. But how it, how sh how it has to be diverted is explained by the spiritual master. It can't be our own mental concoctions. We can't come up with our own ideas. That will not work. We have tried these ideas for unlimited lifetimes. And we haven't achieved success. Therefore, we have to follow what Arjuna did is that he became humble and he took instruction from Krishna. So we have to become humble. We have to admit that our endeavors for achieving happiness in this world have been baffled. And that I haven't achieved what I'm seeking for. When we, when we take that humble position, that's when, that's when the mercy of Krishna consciousness flows. That's when we, we, we achieve uh, the mercy of the spiritual master. That's when we become open to the process of Krishna consciousness. And that is when the soul experiences the bliss and happiness that it's always been seeking for. This is no fantasy. This is no story. Um, um, many of the devotees over here can, uh, can explain about why they're practicing Krishna consciousness for so many years. Over and about that, um, um, the organizers of this program also try to uh, bring a very senior association over here. There are some amazing swamis and uh, um, senior devotees who, who visit this program and they are all um, examples of achieving satisfaction and one can learn from them. So if you want to start a business, you, you should associate with people who know how to do business. Otherwise, you're not going to learn how to do business. So it's the same thing. If we want to become a devotee of Krishna, we should associate with the devotees. And it's a very pleasurable process. And uh, so um, I'll conclude my class here. If there are any questions or comments, um, um, please raise them. Yes, much. Thank you. So uh, I, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you were talking about detachment and, well, attachment, detachment, and then uh, artificial renunciation. Right. Um, I was wondering if you can expand a little bit on the artificial renunciation or false renunciation, because I, I feel like, especially in the beginning of practicing, it may be very easy to, to misunderstand. That's true. And, um, and how, I guess, how to practice properly. Uh, without artificially renouncing certain aspects of our lives, but but like the way you were saying, dovetailing, how how to do that properly? Right. So the first thing that we should understand is that we should take guidance. This is the first most important thing to understand, is because what is artificial, and what is not artificial, is 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 sometimes difficult to understand. We might think we're very capable. I mean, I think oh, you know, I I think I can go and live in a cave in the Himalayas tomorrow. You know, I think I'm capable of doing that. I'm not joking. There are actually people who have done things like this from New York. I've met people on book distribution like that. And uh, they've said that, uh, you know, they, they, would, uh, they, they, they would go. To the, to, they've gone to Tibet and they've, they've done meditation and things like that. And it didn't work for them. And they came back and, and they're like, man, I, I don't feel like I went anywhere. You know. So there are people who have done things like that. Now, therefore, there's, there's guidance is important. Now, that's the first uh, thing. The second thing is, the process of Krishna consciousness, there is renunciation because um, ultimately, we have to give up the desire to enjoy matter. We have to give up the desire to enjoy sense gratification. But we have to understand that this is the other reason why Bhakti Yoga is very 
uh, is an amazing process is because the attachment is just replaced. It is not it is not just given up. If you don't have a replacement to the attachment, you will go back to what you know. You will go back to the only thing you know, which is to enjoy matter. So unless one has cultivated um, you know somewhat some maturity in Krishna consciousness, to renounce one's current condition might only cause one more more misery than 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 um, um, you know spiritual um, emancipation. So therefore, um, in 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 understanding what is artificial and what is not artificial, one should first consider if w the the purpose with which one is one is one is taking the renunciation if one is taking renunciation only to escape from material miseries that is not a very good that is not a very good position for instance um, a person who is aspiring in krishna consciousness might be married and he looks at um, say brahmacharis like myself and okay so we don't have family to take care and you see us maybe we're chanting and dancing on the street sometimes singing and looks like a happy, it is a happy life. I mean, you know, I don't regret it ever. I'm, I'm very happy by Prabhupada's mercy that I have had this opportunity. But if a family man thinks, okay, you know, I hate my wife. I hate, I hate, you know, I hate my wife. I hate my kids. And, you know, I don't know why, but I just hate them. So I'm just going to put saffron and I'm going to dance with those guys. It won't last. The reason is, because he's doing it not for the sake of achieving advancement in Krishna consciousness. He's just doing it as an excuse to escape from responsibilities and duties that he has. That's what Krishna criticizes Arjuna. He says, what, 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 what nonsense are you talking? You're just going to give up everything and go to the forest? You're talking like an uncivilized man. You're talking, he, talk, he said, where, where do these dirty thoughts come, from, come to your mind? Krishna really um, goes heavy on, on Arjuna because Arjuna is sharing a relationship of friendship with Krishna. And so Krishna actually um, calls him derogatory words. But it's just like a friend. And say, hey, are you, what, what's wrong with you? You know, it's like... And so, therefore, the purpose of renunciation should be to make advancement in Krishna consciousness. And some renunciation is good. But... The renunciation should be done in accordance with, with instructions in Bhagavad Gita, which is with instructions from Shastra. And, and before renunciation, there has to be significant attachment that is displayed to Krishna. There has to be a strong sense of attachment. For instance, um, if a person, um, there, for instance, it is... It is it is recommended that those who those who at the, at the age of at the age of 60 or 70 you take at the age of 50 you give up your children because they're expected to have been grown up and you take to full um, you know um, uh, full time uh, or like like uh, engage yourself completely in krishna consciousness not that you're you're still working of course in today's world we have to see whether that age of 50 is, it applies for us or not. But the point is, the renunciation is taken to make further advancement is to give more time to Krishna. If the renunciation, if the aspect of renunciation helps us to gain more time in Krishna consciousness, and that decision is taken with, with understanding of our duties, it cannot be outside the code of duties. If you have a kid that is dependent on you, you have to take care of of that kid. There's, there's no escape from that. And taking care of that is devotional service. That is renunciation. So the thing is, sometimes renunciation is misunderstood as just throwing everything up in the air and, and, and running naked. No. That's not renunciation. Renunciation is renunciation of attachment to developing sense gratification. You can live in your family, but if you stop viewing your wife and kids as objects of your pleasure, then that is renunciation. And that is practical renunciation because here you've renounced, but 
you're still taking care of them because they are your because they are your dependents. This is real renunciation. Whereas artificial renunciation is called monkey renunciation, where these considerations are not taken, and um, and uh, um, therefore it doesn't last because it's 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 artificial and uh, it, it basically you're shifting. What you're thinking is now my objects of sense gratification are my wife. I don't like her. I'm going to turn that object of sense gratification into the ashram of renunciation because when you're saffron, when you're wearing like a sannyasi dress, then people worship you, they give you donations. So, hey, I get, I get free donations. It's an easygoing life. So, you, you get the point? The point is, if we're just switching the, 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 the source of sense gratification, that is not renunciation. Sense gratification has to be given up. And to give that up, the first four things that are, that are recommended is no meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling. Srila Prabhupada explained, this is austerity. That's all. Sure, if you're in a situation like um, if we're employed in a, in, as, as, uh, you know, as a butcher in a slaughterhouse, then yes, you, you should give that up because um, you are engaging in very, very, very uh, your act, acts of, 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 of violence that will neither bring benefit to you or to the animals that you kill. And it brings great misery on this world. So yes, that has to be renounced. There's no question of that. But on other aspects, um, one should have guidance. And to have guidance, one should be also sincere to take proper guidance. Yes, Prabhu. Well, if you have a normal job, like a teacher, or a doctor, or something like that, and you're not, you know, you're a young person, you have many years of work ahead of you, how do you dovetail that work? So, um, there are two ways in which this can be seen. Again, if you're a young person and you have family responsibilities, then the way to do that is the work, everyone has to work. Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that work has to be done. Why? Because work is how this body is going to be maintained. Even, even us, even us so-called um, um, renunciants in society, even we have to work. We have duties. It's not that we cannot work. We have to, um, you know, act according to our, uh, act according to the instructions that's been given to us in our ashram in our dharma because our spiritual master instructed okay you go out chant Hare Krishna and uh, chant Hare Krishna in public do kirtan in Sankirtan and distribute books and teach this knowledge to others if I don't do that if I sit in the if I sit in the monastery and just uh, enjoy donation food that is uh, that is cooked uh, from um, you know all the donations that I that, that is lavished upon us, then I will simply fall down. Such a life is very, con such a life is condemned. So, the point is that everyone has to work. So, okay, so we have, a, you, if a person has a job as a lawyer or a doctor, the best way in which they can dovetail it is first, they understand that they're working for the sake of maintaining the body, which means you don't, you don't overwork. You don't become workaholic you don't become greedy if if the work that you're performing is is um, is enough to maintain your body and soul and the and the soul, body and soul of your of your dependents to keep your body and soul together and the body and soul of your dependents together and uh, you're able to have a roof on top of your head you're able to eat like a normal human being then Stay in that position and be satisfied. Not that um, now I have to try to become the CEO of a company. And then when one accepts too much material uh, responsibilities, then there's no time for spiritual activity. So there has to be, so that's one um, um, way to, that's, that's one aspect. The second aspect is the fruit of one's work should be given to Krishna. The fruit of one's labor should be given to Krishna. How can it be given to Krishna? Krishna says in the, um, it's, it's, it's stated in the Isha Upanishad, 
um, the first verse that um, Isa vashim idam sarvam yatkincha jagantyam jagatena tektena bunjita magadha kasya suddhanam. So, that the Supreme Personality of Godhead has created everything in this world and everything belongs to that Isha, that Supreme Lord. Tena tektena bunjita, take what you need to survive. All animals do this. The reason why humans have karma and the reason why animals don't is because only humans act out of greed. Not, no species of animal will act out of greed. The elephant can, 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 um, can, can you know, is, is powerful enough to, to kill several animals in a forest. And uh, every elephant requires about, you know, uh, I think about 110 pounds of food every day. And let's remember the Roman herds. So you can imagine if there's a herd of elephants and there are 10, 10 of them, they require 1,000 pounds of food minimum every day. Who's supplying? Krishna is supplying. Right? Now, the elephants don't think, okay, now, you know, we're so powerful, let's wipe out all these, um, you know, creatures in the forest, let's wipe out all the deer, whatever, you know. They don't do that. They don't act beyond their boundaries. The elephants could think, these tigers, they're a big nuisance, so let's all group together and kill all the tigers even if they don't attack us. They don't do that. That's because animals act according to instinct, and instinct, as we understand from, from the Vedas, instinct is that which is given by Krishna. So, we also have to act according to our needs. Whatever is our needs, we take that needs. And the rest... And the needs include, for instance, if one has a family, to have some savings also. You have to, you have to prepare for some, for maybe, you know, um, tough times. But not that you're, you're, you're amassing so much wealth that five generations down the line can live on the wealth that you've amassed. And you give the rest of the fruit of your labor to Krishna. You give it for the propagation of Krishna consciousness, which in this case, in most cases, is the money that is earned. And in this way, one gets all the benefit of, of practicing Krishna consciousness. Of course, this doesn't mean, this also means, at, at the same time, one should still chant one's the prescribed number of rounds, the 16 number of rounds, follow the four regular principles associated with the devotees. This should all also be done. Ideally, um, Srila Prabhupada explains that 50% of, of, of one's income should be given for the propagation of Krishna consciousness. But this is not a, a rule set in stone. It, it depends on one's personal situation. Um, for many people in New York, that might not be very practical. Um, does that answer your question? Thank you. Um, yes, Prabhu. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, what please. Should be our attitude towards different uh, natures? Religions? Natures. Natures. Um, which natures? People. Oh, people's natures? Different people's yeah, natures? Okay. So, wh a person in knowledge understands that different natures arise because of different karmic, um, you know, permutations and combinations. That, therefore, sometimes you find a particular race to have per a particular set of characteristics. Because there is some common karma that they share. And then that particular race has a particular set of characteristics. To identify such characteristics is not discrimination, it is knowledge. But, the point is, you do not discriminate on the basis of one of, of the person's nature. Everyone has their role to play. Everyone has a role to play. The society needs everyone. The society needs intellectuals. The society needs administrators. The society needs, um, uh, you know, the mercantile class, the businessmen. The society also needs laborers. But that's just to maintain one's body. Just because you're the owner of a CEO doesn't make you any, any better than a taxi driver. He's maintaining your body, you're maintaining your body. What's the difference? 
but he is maintaining his body with the ability that he has. This is the attitude. And he, the, the laborer or the taxi driver and the CEO are ultimately in front of Krishna. They're the same. Not that the CEO, Krishna says, oh, you're CEO, you know, great, you know, you're extremely successful in the material world, I salute you. And now Krishna doesn't say these kind of things. It's the same. And therefore, and, and what is the view of a devotee? The view of a devotee is the same view that Krishna has. And the devotee is only concerned about the spirit soul and is concerned about how both the taxi driver and the CEO can be benefited by Krishna consciousness. Can be benefited. He teaches both. Teaches both of them. He gives them the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. He gives them Srila Prabhupada's books. He gives them Prashadam. Treats them the same way. Why does there need to be discrimination? Just like you see over here, there, there are people of different races assembled over here. There is no discrimination. Um, it's not that uh, the uh, the one person gets, uh, you know, um, when, 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 when the prasadam is being served out, one person gets uh, 10 items and the other person, oh, you know, sorry, you, you get only two. No. Everything, everyone is treated the same. Because this is an atmosphere for us to cultivate that spirit of seeing the spirit. Of seeing every single part, every single soul is part and parcel of Krishna. So, but at the same time, different people are engaged. Just like if you are, even in this program, different devotees do different services. Some person might clean uh, the floor after the program another person might be cooking or someone like myself I'm lecturing over here it doesn't make me better than the person who cleaned the floor hey Prabhu you know I lectured now you come and massage my feet no that's that's a bodily conception he's doing service I'm also doing service my service today was to speak his service is to clean in Krishna's eyes it's all the same so this that answer your question? I'm thinking of Tomasic and Jessic. Okay. But you know, I, mean, I, I think I'm able to distinguish between Tomasic and Jessic inside. Okay. Um, we got some time, or? And this will be the last question. Right. Okay. That's it. So, um, Tomasic, Raj, okay, Rajasic, Tomasic, and Satvik. The only way to understand all this is that sattva, the mode of goodness, is closer to achieving self-realization. It helps one achieve self-realization better. And rajasik is mode of passion, is desire to do a lot of activity. And tamasik is a little more lazy. But all these natures are overcome when one practices Krishna consciousness. Different people might have different natures, but it... In, 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 in the application of Krishna consciousness, it's the same process. It's the same process. Of course, someone likes to do more work. Okay, you give them more work. Because they want to do more service. So you give them more service. The other person is a little more older. It does a little service. You give them a little service. But um, ultimately, you don't treat them differently differently. Um, in the sense of spiritual uh, um, or opportunity for spiritual service. Everyone is given equal opportunity. But different people according to their different natures would act differently. So, and uh, it's better to, in one's personal practice, to give up tendencies of r rajasik and tamasik because they are not so conducive for, for achieving Krishna consciousness. They run against Krishna consciousness. But the mode of goodness, anyways, this is another class about explaining about what each mode is. But the mode of goodness doesn't mean that just one just sits and just closes one eyes and has a smile on one face. The mode of goodness is just that one acts with knowledge. The mode of goodness is identified primarily by knowledge. And even higher than the mode of goodness is Vishuddha Sattva or mode of transcendental goodness, which is about the three material modes of nature because even goodness, passion and ignorance is ultimately material. When one arises about this, 
and be, become situated on the transcendental platform or the Krishna platform, then uh, that's when one has achieved um, uh, the perfection of human life. Okay, I'll stop here. Um, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. Kvancha kalpatru vishnu kvasana 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 vish